Good morning and welcome to this January 17th, 2021 online Sunday service for First Presbyterian Church. Uh, as always, we welcome our brothers and sisters who are gathering us here today as well as all of our guests and visitors. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This morning as we begin our service, I just wanted to remind everyone that there is a slight change in our office hours for uh, the next little while um, in light of the pandemic and my children having to stay home to do virtual learning. Um, I found that we, we needed all the help that we could get at home, so I will be here at the church on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The days have not changed, but the hours will be now from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. rather than in the morning. So if you uh, need to drop by to drop off your, your offerings, your gifts or donations or anything like that, or if that time doesn't work out for you, then please either reach out to myself or any of our elders, any of the members of our board of managers, and we'll make sure that we do everything we can to uh, accommodate you. In the midst of this state of emergency for uh, Ontario, I do pray that you continue to remain diligent, that you continue to remain safe. Uh, with not knowing what things will look like over the next couple weeks, uh, really, I, I encourage you to come before the Lord in prayer, come to his scriptures and find comfort uh, for your souls, for your weary souls and spirits. Because as we continue in this lockdown, yes, we, we may be exhausted and we may be anxious and fearful, but we can trust in the Lord always to grant us the comfort that we need. One of the ways that we are trying to uh, make it possible for us to remain connected in the midst of this uh, pandemic is to have our coffee break. Um, it's a once a week uh, Zoom meeting that we are gathering on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. This past week at 10 a.m., please forgive me, um, I had scheduled the Zoom meeting for 10 a.m. but had double booked myself with an ultrasound for our fourth uh, soon to be coming baby. Uh, and so it, it and I left my phone at home and so all of this had just happened um, and so we tried to make up for it and had a zoom meeting at 3 p.m. on that same day where about six or seven of us had gathered and it was still a nice time for us to gather and say hello uh, but this week for sure at 10 a.m. Uh, on Tuesday we'll be gathering once again on zoom for our first Presbyterian Church family coffee break and I hope to see you then. At this time, we gather, let us gather our hearts as we come before the Lord to worship and honor and adore him as we sing together hymns, as we read together scripture, and as we hear a message uh, from him. Let us join our hearts together for the call to worship, which is based on Psalm 139 verses 1 to 6. O Lord, you have searched my heart and only you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. 
Even before a word is on my tongue, you, O Lord, know it. You surround me and go behind and before me and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, so high, I cannot attain it. Let us come before the Lord in worship. gather our hearts to pray. Lord, we gather ourselves to you. In this moment, we gather our hearts to you. We gather our minds and our spirits. And though we are not together physically, we, we gather as your body. Wherever we are right now, we ask that you would come and meet with us. We know that it is you who are inviting us into your home, into, into uh, your family, into your kingdom. It is you who are inviting us to worship you. You are coming to meet with us, O oh Lord. And so may we uh, have our heart and hearts softened to this day as we come to worship and adore you. Remind us today of your grace. Remind us of your love. Remind us of the depth of your mercy and compassion for each of us. That you call us your beloved children and you know us by name. Heavenly Father, as we come together to sing praises, as we come together to read your word, may you be honored and glorified. O oh Lord, uh, we ask at this time as we uh, focus our attention to you, that you would help us to turn our hearts from the things of this world. And as we come to you to hear a word from your spirit, as we come to read your scripture, that the meditation of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth would be pleasing to you. We pray all these things uh, according to uh, your, your precious son's holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, our first scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 6. I am reading from the English Standard Version. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our New Testament passage is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And our red letter portion for today is taken from Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 20. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Over the last many, many, many weeks, we had touched a few times here and there about how Jesus, if he was the Messiah, prophesied about in scriptures, uh, was it expected to do certain things. Of course, uh, we know through the writings of the gospel and the testimony of the disciples that Jesus was, is indeed the Messiah and Savior. But for most of the ancient Jewish people, Jesus was the return of the returning of a king. Um, he, it was a returning of a king to establish the pride and glory of the Jewish and Davidic kingdom. They believed that he would bring back the glory days of this kingdom. Uh, once again, they thought we will get to go back to the good old days. This might hit close to home for us because as we pray and as we are patient, as we are waiting through this pandemic, we might be waiting and expecting Jesus to bring us back to the way things were, to, to bring us back to, to what was normal. But that is something that we will certainly need to discern because the Lord may very well be leading us into a time uh, where our traditions may be in for a drastic and permanent change. Who would have thought that, um, you know, this pandemic would have lost it, lasted even longer than three months? We are here in the new year now, and already our faith life and what it looks like to, to come together to worship has changed uh, so drastically. Yet we know that despite all that has happened and everything that will happen, we know that the Lord will continue to uphold and sustain and maintain his church. I saw a post the other day where a mother was saying that kids these days really deserve a lot of credit. Uh, these kids who have no regular school, who have limited to no socializing, uh, no normal holidays, and even no snow days to look forward to, uh, these kids are, are doing so well given the circumstances, and yet she wasn't handling things half as well as they were. And I had to pause there and think about my kids because I began to feel that this was so true. While I was struggling with what it would look, what what virtual learning looks like, and having to deal with these kids, they are, they seem to be thriving, and this is the world that they now live in. The thing is, is that we carry these expectations about life and faith. And when they do not go our way in our self-centeredness, in our desire to remain in control, we tend to cling on to that which is familiar. We cling on to our ex expectations of the way things ought to be. And yet time and time again, Jesus seemed to disrupt what humanity had interpreted out of the writings of the Torah and of the prophets. In order, uh, what humanity had interpreted out of these scriptures in order to fit their own world views and values. We do this sometimes, often, dangerously as well. Where we look to scriptures to, to pave a way towards a future that we, by our own wisdom, by our own thoughts and, and planning, believe to be right and good and fitting with what we know and expect. If we look to today's reading in Matthew chapter 8, starting from verse 18, it says that now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side, and a scribe came up to, and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds ha of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. A scribe was a distinguished professional uh, back in ancient times. They were comparable maybe to today's lawyers, uh, journalists, government ministers, or, um, or judges. Uh, they were wealthy, they were well-educated, they were well-respected in society. 
And this scribe, who was probably a Jewish scribe, came to Ju Jesus calling him teacher, calling him rabbi, saying that he would follow Jesus wherever he went. And if you look at how he was speaking, he wasn't asking Jesus, could, could I follow you? He was saying that he would follow Jesus as a matter of fact. And it's very possible that this man was very, very serious, that he really did want to follow Jesus. But it is also very possible that he was doing this in order to make a show of himself, to show just how faithful a man of his status could be. Whatever the case may be, Jesus responds by telling him, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. What a peculiar response. Why was Jesus responding to the scribe like this? He was doing this because Jesus wanted to let him and the crowds know who they were following. Jesus was saying that they were following the son of man who was effectively at the time of his ministry homeless. He, he wandered around doing his ministry, and he was saying, watch how I am living. Watch how I am serving others and healing. Watch how I am teaching. Watch me. Look at who I am. am. Do you know who I am? In other words, Jesus was asking, do you truly know who it is you are saying you are going to follow? Before you decide to say that you will follow me, be sure to know who I am. For the scribe who was wealthy and well-regarded in society, it is possible that his idea of what it meant to follow Jesus was skewed by what was happening around him. Uh, to, to become the follower, the, the disciple of a rabbi or of a great cre uh, teacher in, in those days was a high social honor. It was culturally something that people strived towards. Is this what the scribe was clinging to? this reputation or, or this position, the student of this great teacher, Jesus? Was he looking towards the status and reputation of being a disciple of this great teacher, this miracle worker, this healer, this possible Messiah? What glory it would bring him to say he was the disciple of Jesus Christ? Was he thinking of these kind of things rather than looking at Jesus and knowing who Jesus was? Now, I don't think we really know what becomes of him. In the Gospels, we read of several people who say they will, follow, uh, they will come to follow Jesus, and some do, and some others turn away. What happens to this scribe is not outlined for us here. We are left with a bit of a cliffhanger here, leaving us to wonder what became of the scribe. And this kind of storytelling was a common practice in ancient literature. Uh, we see it uh, in the book of Jonah, for example, where the book suddenly ends on a cliffhanger uh, where God asks Jonah, do you do well to be angry with what I have done? In the same way as Jesus asks the scribe, do you know who you are following? We are left on this cliffhanger. And this is kind of a, uh, a strategy that, that's, that's, that writers uh, kind of used back in ancient times uh, because we are not only left with the question as to whether the scribe follows Jesus or not, but essentially the, what the authors are trying to put across to us is asking us that very question. In other words, when we read, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus is talking to the scribe, but he is also talking to you and I. As we read this, we must have this realization that it is you and I who are in this position, at this time, the scribe. In other words, as, as us who are those who say we follow Jesus, before we even come to count the cost of what uh, it means to follow Jesus, which we will look at next week, Jesus is first asking, you who would call yourself Christians, you who say you would follow me, do you know who I am? Do you really know what I have been sent here to do? Do you know what I am teaching? Do you know the life that I have modeled for you? 
Because for many of us, we have come to know abundance in this life here. We have come to know relative comfort and peace. We have not truly experienced suffering and abuse, violence, oppression, hunger, even as many do. And we, have, we may have carried for us and we may continue to carry uh, with us for a long time these ideas and expectations of Jesus. We have lived following him as faithfully as we know how to. Yes, we have loved and prayed and given with depth and generosity and with sincerity. But today I believe Jesus in, in saying this, that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, is asking us, do you know who I am? When, just before, if you read in Matthew chapter 8, uh, when Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law and continues to heal uh, many, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew reminds us of the prophecy of Christ who would come to take on our illnesses and bear our diseases. We read this today in Isaiah 53. In verse 4 it says, He, came, he comes to bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. But what else does this passage in Isaiah remind us of? In the second part of verse 2, Isaiah 53, he says, it says, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows, or he is a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Uh, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. In verse 5, it says, he, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the ch chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. This is the Christ that came. He was one who had no form or majesty that the world would desire him in any way. In fact, the world would come to despise him, even today still. Christ has nowhere to lay his head because he is not of the kingdoms of this world. He, in fact, is, is not anything like people were expecting him to be. What they desired was a king to rise up and, and overthrow the conquerors of this world so that the kingdom of, of God could be established, the kingdom of Israel, of the Hebrew people, the kingdom of David could be established and Britain so that they could be brought back into these days of glory. But Jesus, he was nothing like they had expected. He is, yes, the king of heaven, but he was one who came down from his throne to be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And we have, indeed, all like sheep have gone astray, for we are following our own ways, following our own conceptions and assumptions about Jesus Christ, thinking we know enough but it is for us that, that Christ had come. We, the lost sheep, us whom he calls by name. And it is this Christ that we must come to know more fully. In John chapter 3, verse 30, it reads, He must become greater, I must become less. And so, before you know what you're supposed to be doing, before you think about how you ought to be living, um, or what it means and looks like to be faithful. The question that we must pose ourselves is, do I know Jesus? And some of us may be tempted to say, yes, of course I know Jesus. He was the son of the Virgin Mary. He was born on Christmas Day. His father was a carpenter. Um, he did this and that miracles. And, and I know all the stories. But do you truly know Jesus? Because the thing is, many of us, we, we do know to, on some level. We know the stories. We, we know what he did. We know that he died and rose again. But Jesus is inviting us, even today, to come to know him more. And as, as you and I, brothers and sisters, who call ourselves you know, believers, who, who call ourselves disciples and followers of Jesus, has there been a moment in our hearts or in our minds where we have arrogantly thought to ourselves, we know Jesus enough. Because 
Truly, there is never any way that we would come to a full and complete knowledge of Christ, because that would be absurd. He is the living God. He will always be, in part, a mystery to us. It would make absolutely no sense that creation could fully grasp the whole of the mystery of the Creator. But even when you think of your friends, when you think of your children and your spouses, do you know them fully and completely? No, of course not. We may know them very, very well, but we will never, ever uh, cease learning about them. Every day we learn something new. Every day I'm learning something new about my children. Every day I'm learning something new about my spouse. Even more so with Christ. How could we ever in our minds and in our hearts ever think that we know enough about him, that we don't need to come to him in prayer, and that we don't need to come to his word? Do you know Jesus? Do you see who he sits and eats with? Do you see who he heals? Do you know his humility? Do you know his holiness? Do you know his grace and mercy? Do you understand the depth of the sacrifice he made for you? Come to know him more. By spending time in the, in, in, in the full word of God, by spending time with him in prayer, Yes, grow in your relationship with Christ. There is no better time to do this than now. For we are not left to do this on our own, even though we feel isolated and even though we wish we could gather in our Bible study groups or, or amongst our friends. We are not left to try and figure out who Christ is by our own. We Invite the Helper, the, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit to help us as we grow in Him. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting from verse 16, From now on, therefore, we regard no one uh, according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the mystery of reconciliation. We are created anew in Christ by the Spirit. We are not tied to our earthly understandings of the world or of God even. And while the scribe would have only understood the Messiah according to, the, to this world and the flesh, we get to regard him this way no longer. We are re reconciled to Christ by the Spirit, which has renewed us and given us the eyes of faith to see beyond uh, what is just in front of us and into the promises of Christ found for us in scriptures. When the scribe said, teacher, I will follow you, Jesus says to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. As Paul wrote, to know Jesus is to be reconciled to him, to be reconciled to he who had nowhere to lay his head, to be reconciled to him clothed in his righteousness made new, not so that we could be of better social standing, not so that we can proudly wear Christ's name on a jersey like our favorite hockey team, per se. Not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of whom? As Paul writes in verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness, not of ourselves, but become the righteousness of God. We come to know Christ. We grow in our knowledge of Christ. We grow in our relationship of Christ, becoming ambassadors for him, for the benefit of God and his kingdom. Is this the life that you are willing to live? For you who have said to Jesus, uh, Jesus, I am willing to follow you. Do you understand what this means? Do you understand uh, what it means to, to follow the Son of Man who had nowhere to lay his head, 
whose home is not here? Who, uh, what does, to, do you understand what it means to, to be a disciple of this Messiah? We'll get to examine this a little closer next week. As we will get to see, there is certainly a cost to following Christ. But uh, as one of my favorite worship songs sings, we have counted up the cost of following Jesus. And we have determined that he is worth it. I have counted up the cost. I have counted up the cost. And you are worth it. Let us pray. O great teacher, giver of life, O holy God, O Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and we give you praise for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We have done nothing to deserve or earn our faith, but you have given us the eyes, these spiritual eyes where we can come to see you and to know you to hear from you. And so, Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to grow in our knowledge of who you are. Let us not be limited by our own desires and our own wants. Break down the barriers and the walls of our preconceptions and our assumptions of our own agendas and help us to look to you. When we say that we want to follow you, O oh Lord, help us to see clearly who you are before we can determine how we, are ought to, how we ought to live or what we are to do, let us see you clearly. Remove the scales from our eyes and soften our hearts. In these days, as we enter into this, uh, this new state of emergency, O oh Lord, may it be you who brings us comfort. May we come to your word, may we come to you in prayer, and may we get a sense of your peace and of your presence, of your comfort and strength that upholds each of us. Teach us more of you. May you become greater so that we become less. May you become greater as we become less. We surrender ourselves to you. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are in need of your presence, for those who are sick, for those who are hurting, for those who are in pain, for those who are sad, for those who are in mourning, for those who are grieving, for those of us who are exhausted. We pray for our first responders and our teachers and, and all of those in our community who in, in such terrible circumstances are doing so much for, for us. We ask for your protection and your encouragement over them. Lord, we come before you knowing that we have put our faith in ourselves and put our faith in things of this world rather than you. We come before you with repentant hearts, asking us, asking that by your Holy Spirit, you would help us turn away from this world and back to you. Let us return to you today. Hear the confessions of our hearts as we, have lift, as we lift up every way in which we have been disobedient to you. Teach us to love. Teach us to be patient. Teach us to be kind. Teach us to be gracious as you have been gracious to us. For every gift that we bring to you, breathe upon it and use it to build your kingdom for your glory, 
For those of us who wish we could give more and who were unable to give, receive our hearts as an act of worship that is pleasing to you. We lift up these prayers to you as we pray the prayer that you, O Lord, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me. Now may you go and grow in the knowledge of the grace of God, in the peace and of the person of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit that chases out all fear and sets us free into a life that is full and abundant. And go abiding in him so that you may fulfill the very purpose for which you were created, called, and sent. Amen. <laughs>